Lurkers. I'm Lauren Stone, the owner and founder of PopLurker.com, and today we're going to talk about the convention industry, our current climate, and things you can do to be a better convention organizer. Let's jump in. In case you haven't seen any other articles I've written about conventions or the art or the video that I made about Sexy Cosplay Con, one of my gigs is that I am a convention promoter, which means that I organize, execute, and run conventions. Now, in your mind, you might hear the word convention and think of like a three to five day nerd summer camp sleepaway San Diego Comic Con, massive, like multi-million dollar event. And that's just really not always the case. Conventions, expos, festivals can be single day events where you still want to, of course, hit all the buttons of a large, large show, but you can do them on a smaller scale. You still have celebrity guests, you still have panels and programming, you still have a lot to do on the back end, processing press and media requests, and again, just you know, being very, very organized, making sure that you've been to good shows so you know what makes a good show and what does not make a good show. That's what some of the things we're gonna talk about today. Before we discuss 10 things you need to know in order to be a successful convention organizer, I want to just quickly address a question that people have been asking me. What is the future of the conventions industry in our current health climate and what will events look like in 2021? I feel so sorry for the people, and I mean there's no condescension, I'm not patronizing. There are so many people who think like January 1st, 2021 is going to, you know, gear up and like snap 2020 was all a bad dream. And there's no illness and there's no masks and there's no restrictions on events and public concerts or anything like that. And to, to people who think that, I say one, I'm so sorry, and two, you're delusional because this isn't going away, man. We're, as of this recording, we're already in November and there's no signs of it coming back. Now, with that said, if you have lots of money and you don't mind not making money and you just wanna throw a show so people have something to do, you can still do that. There are limitations on indoor gatherings that if it's worth your time, you can adhere to, but let me explain why it's a really bad idea and I've been telling people this and they see my point immediately. And again, I'm not making fun of our current climate. I miss events like the rest of you do, but this is kind of the restrictions and the confines that we have going on. So you tell me if it'd be worth your time and money to throw a show in this climate. Standard event that I throw the small single day ones has about anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 attendees through the whole day. And that's from like a 10, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. like store hours show. Each of those attendees will be charged anywhere from 10 to 15 dollars for the ticket depending on the how lavish the show is. We have tons of celebrity guests, multiple panel rooms, the cost of admission is going to be more. If it's a show that has maybe five or six guests, single panel room and a smaller venue, which means lower cost, we're not gonna charge as much because we want people to make, we wanna make sure people have a nice time and they feel like their money to fun ratio was balanced. You gotta think about that stuff. In a small hotel show, if I can typically have, you know, let's just say again, a thousand attendees and I'm charging them $10, I can very easily pay the cost of, of the hotel room and the ball and the lunches I buy for my guests and any other bells and whistles I choose to add to the show. And I can walk home not owing money. You know, it's not, it's not like the most massive payday and I'm okay with that, but I get to walk home having made a profit for my show. Let's look at a bigger location, like an actual convention center in a city. That's gonna cost you double if not triple as much as a little hotel ballroom and with the restrictions in place, like in order to make, in order to walk away with a profit, you need to make, have double or triple the attendees. So in our current health climate, where we're being told that we cannot have more than 150 attendees throughout the day, we need to scale back our vendors to half of what they are for the location so that we can have six feet of space in between everybody. And oh, JK, the cost of the venue is not lowered, but you are gonna throw a party that was originally intended for one to 5,000 people 
or more in a massive show, 20,000 people, 40,000 people, are you gonna throw that same party for literally 150 people? Because that's the current restriction. You will go so broke, your vendors, your guests will not make any money, and you know, finances aside, like we, there is love of the, there's love of the event sphere, there's love of the convention, there's love of the fandom in there, a hundred percent, or we wouldn't be doing this. It's not a cash grab, but for 150 attendees, not making your money back, nobody's making any money that day. There is literally no point to hold the show. That is why we, my group and I, have segued into outdoor events where we can have more people. We don't charge for admission at this point. You know, we just want to give people something to do. But if you're gonna just give people something to do, you gotta shrink the model, like, significantly. And so far, that's working. And that's what I think is going to happen first. Outdoor concerts will be coming back before indoor things, festivals, outdoor carnivals, drive-in movies. Like, there's gonna be things to do. And we're all gonna segue into this, like, figuring out what our restrictions are, how to do it, how to make it safe. But in the meantime, you can take these, this quiet moment to kind of figure out what kind of show that you would that you want to throw and how to be the best event organizer that you can be once our climate returns to sort of a normal space. Going into that, here are my 10 tips to being the best convention organizer that you can be. First one I have for you really is just like keep your fingers on the pulse. If you want to throw a pop culture event or a whatever your event is, arts and crafts, um, candle making, like it doesn't matter. Whatever your niche is, you have to keep your finger to the pulse. So what are people always saying? If you want to write books, you have to read books. In order to throw a pop culture or otherwise event, you have to go to these events. You can't just manifest it out of nowhere and have no idea what the fans of this thing are doing. You have to be in it because you are part of this sphere. I've seen so many, usually first time promoters, but there's exceptions to that. I've seen so many promoters really just think it's all money, that there's just secret money, just pirate treasure hidden in the convention sphere, and so they just want to do it. They're not fans of anything, they don't like anything pop culture related, they don't read any sort of graphic novels or comics or consume, you know, anime if it's an anime show, or play video games if it's a video game show, but like they think there's money in there, so they're like, we're going right for this, this is a business. And it's a little weird. Next tip I have for you is do what you know and learn what you do not. And so basically what I mean by that is examine your strengths. If you're really good at organizing or if you, like I started doing conventions in the press sphere, so I knew a lot of other people with, you know, nerd media outlets and who did convention reviews. I did convention reviews. You know, that's, that's sort of how I got into this and met the right people and sort of built upward. But when I did not know how to, let's say, devise a programming schedule, a panel schedule, like that's when I really started talking to people and meeting people who did. If you go to a show and you don't know the first thing about how to make panels and programming, go talk to the programming director or whatever their title is. Go talk to people, like peel back the curtain and ask questions if you're interested in this. And ask them from a genuine and sincere place. You know like in the movie uh, Showgirls? <laughs> like don't get into it so you can push people down the stairs, man. Like, and don't befriend people just so you can like get their information and like run off with it. That's freaking creepy. But more like ask from a sincere place. Let your intentions be known right away that this is something that you want to get into. Help with other shows. Volunteer at shows before you even consider running your own. Learn the tips and tricks, learn the different avenues, and figure out all of those layers that go into it. Because there's all these little you know, boxes that need to be checked. And if you're not at least intermediate level at all of them, your show is going to be very disorganized. So you need to make sure that you understand how these different parts of the machine move. Next one is Think before starting a turf war. <laughs> like really, this is important. And this kind of goes back to going to shows. Like in order to run a good show, you need to go to shows and like them. You need to go to these events and actually enjoy them. Because if you are like, I'm gonna throw a toy show. Like I'm gonna throw a, I'm gonna make a show based around vintage toys. 
but like there's already one in that area that's well known like you need to know what shows are being produced in this area before you like think that you know before you like christopher columbus it and just flop your dick onto this land that nobody asked you to conquer you really need to understand <laughs> audience the culture of the town what they do and do not already have as far as pop culture events and what you might encounter by putting your show there there is drama in the convention sphere you have people who have the like i want i want to have a show here i want to do this like i'm gonna do it i'm gearing up i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna and they just never do it and so you know when i'm scoping out areas to put a show in and there's nothing there, there's no pop culture presence. And I'm like, I'm gonna put something in this town. And so I do, and then minutes later I hear, wait, but I was going to, well, you didn't. Like, I didn't take your idea, you just didn't. You know, I didn't, how can I steal the idea that you had for your book that you haven't written? You gotta act, man. You gotta, whoever, whoever strikes first wins, you know? The next tip I have, you cannot be lazy. The reason that the role of the show organizer is also called the promoter is because it's your job to promote your show. It is your job to make sure that you've spread the word of the nerd as best as you can. There was this one show here, I'm not gonna out them and be rude and like, you know, throw shade, but there was this one show here that failed, just collapsed, failed. Wasn't mine. I went to it to check it out to see what it was like and it was just, it was like the worst show I'd ever been to. Uh, I think Scott has stories of worse shows he's been to. Problem was with that promoter is that he thought he had an idea that was so majestic. Like he just had the convention that everybody wanted to go to and thought was just like hands off. He's like, this is so good that everybody's gonna wanna come and the word of it will spread on its own. And that is not, the case whatever you need to do you need to make sure that you've had checked your list and ensured that you're promoting this thing if you rely on people who've never even been to your event so it has no reputation yet if it's the first time you can't rely on them to do it for you that's lazy you you are the promoter and you need to do it yourself every means necessary you cannot let your show fail my next point this is your event you need to be able to do it all so what does that mean? It means, again, if you are gonna have programming that you know how to make a successful programming schedule and organize and prioritize the panels, you need to make sure that you know how to book celebrity talent and negotiate that celebrity talent so that you won't go home broke or owing money on a really expensive guarantee or something like that. You need to make sure that you can make a functioning website. You need to make sure that you have the ability to process press and media applications. You really need to be a jack of all trade in order to successfully make a show. You need to know how to coordinate volunteers and get volunteers if it's a show that has volunteers. You really have to work hard. In case everyone falls through and you still need to make this show, that you can do it by yourself if you had to. Next point, keep your show's goals realistic and modest, at least in the very beginning. There are so many people who just think that any pop culture idea they have deserves to be, like I was saying before, this three to five day nerd summer camp party. <laughs> think the idea of like a fandom meetup at a comic book store or like a picnic or even something virtual until it's like, okay, now it's time to meet up, um, for, has been has become a little bit lost. I think that there's something, probably there'll be less now because of our health climate, but even as recently as two years ago, three years ago, I feel like there was something out there that made people think that if it's pop culture related, it can be a convention. You know, there was a joke like, oh, there's a show for that, there's a show for that, there's a show for that. And we thought that the convention, it, bubble was going to pop not because of an illness but because there was just so many shows the calendars were stuffed it was oversaturated there was two shows two you know two to six shows a day every weekend around here in the los angeles area let alone the rest of the country in the world like there was just stuff happening all the time now something can grow a meetup something at the park the picnic a picnic 
um, a comic book store, at the mall, while these things maybe can grow into a full day event with guests and speakers and, you know, entertainment, there is nothing wrong with just meeting up with your people because you guys all like something. Just because you love Sailor Moon doesn't mean it has to be a, a Sailor Moon convention. Maybe it can just be a meetup somewhere, which I've done. You know, I've done Sailor Moon meetups at the park. Maybe it can be a full day of fun somewhere very modest. Um, then you don't think about admission and you don't think about going home with a paycheck because it's just not time. I once had an idea for a Mystery Science Theater 3000 convention, like one day event. But before I realized that all of my people, my fans, were dispersed around the country. There wasn't even enough local interest to do a meetup at a comic book shop. It takes really specific elements. Not just being a fan of the thing, but now you need people who are local or people that will come in or people that want to do this. And some people were like, I don't want to just meet up with fans. Like I need somebody who is an artist or a producer or an actor on the show. So, and that's their right. That's totally fine too. This one might seem like a no brainer, but it's still worth talking about. And that is be a person that other people want to work with <laughs> and work for. Be a person that others want to work with and work for. You can't be absent. You can't be a prima donna. You can't be somebody that doesn't answer emails. You can't be someone who is hostile or a show off, or has no humility, or doesn't treat their talent well, or has a reputation as being icy or wooden or a fake nerd. You really, it, need, it all needs to stem, I don't mean to be redundant, but it all needs to stem from a place of passion and organization. And that, I think it's, I think that's really, really important. I really think that a show can be special in any budget. It's not like you have to give your celebrity talent all massive suites and a very expensive hotel and like treat them to steak dinners. Like there's, that's super schmooze. But there's just little things that you can do to set yourself apart from other promoters and other people who are throwing shows. Which segues into my next point is about presenting like a boss. It's so easy and even though pop culture is nerd culture these days, like being a nerd is cool, there's still that reputation of the sloppy nerd. And if you show up to work, if you're the one throwing the show and you come to work looking like a slob, looking like amateur hour, looking like a guy in his basement or a dumpy girl, I really think it's important. Like when I throw a show, I dress like a boss. I'm wearing either a dress and you know, my, and flats, I don't do heels. <laughs> I'm too, I'm too tall and heavy to successfully do heels, so heels doesn't work. But I'm in nice boots, or I'm in nice flats, and I wear my dresses, or I'm in a really nice button-down shirt with, like, nice work-specific pants. I really do my best to make sure I present like a professional, because I think that it either, it either makes people feel like, oh, okay, everything's under control here, or it might make, you know, some fans think this show is very pretentious and who does she think she is and blah, blah, blah. I don't care. That's, if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. But more often than not, I think it's, it's makes it look like the show is run by professionals, not just fans, which kind of contradicts what I was saying because you do have to be a fan of fandom before throwing a fandom show. But you still want to present like a boss, like a grown up. It's about setting the mood for how you will treat your customers, how you and how you will treat your staff, and when you look, when you look the part and present and show everyone that that them coming to your show was worth you putting a few extra minutes into your appearance because this is a business. This one drives me nuts. This isn't just specifically the pop culture sphere, but this is like any startup or anyone who considers themselves an entrepreneur or like a digital content creator or a showrunner, and that's like thinking that you're entitled to success without putting in that foundation of work. I have met so many people who are like, small time blogger isn't even the word, like their stuff has no reach and they're just like, I wanna get products to review, I deserve it. How come I'm not making money on my thing yet? Like, give it a minute, dude, you gotta put in the work. Same with your shows, you have to throw the event or make it modest enough that it will be financially viable. 
And by that, I mean you might walk home with $200 to $1,000 and that's what you get, but like you're not in the red. You know, you don't owe anything. So when, for people who think that they throw a convention or a, or a show for the day and they're entitled to walk home with $10,000 or it's not worth their time, like that, whoa, slow it down. Like, yes, none of us want to be in debt, but oh my God, like, come on, man. You got to put in the work and build the brand of the show. And then over time, yes, you'll, you know, you'll start seeing some return on it by reputation and hopefully financial. And lastly, you always want to keep the technical elements in the forefront. What does this mean? Remember that a convention or a show or an expo or a festival is not just a big party for you and your friends to like come and get, get you know, see the cosplayers or have toys brought for you or whatever the niche of your, your show is, whatever the, whatever the specific element is. There are things you have to keep in the forefront, such as ADA requirements. You have to keep in mind that if you're having a cosplay contest, you should bring release forms for those cosplayers to sign so that there's no, you use my face without permission, you know, things happening. There's definitely needs to be signage, like in our current climate with masks and making sure that everything is measured six feet apart if that's, if that's what needs to happen in your area still. You want to make sure that there is security of some fashion, that if there's, that you have a procedure in place, that if there's an incident or an injury, what are you gonna do? So again, this might seem like business running 101, but I think that for some people who just want people to come to the show and pay, pay them money and yay, you go home with a paycheck, um, you may not think of these things. And some of these things you learn in real time as there's a problem, you go, oh no, we didn't address that. So you add it to your list of like, we're gonna do it better next time, we're gonna do better next time. But there's just really, again, technical elements that you have to keep your fingers on in order to make sure that you're not, you know, blindsided or that, that, you know, it doesn't sneak up behind you and like bash you on the back of the head. Like, so anything like that, again, ADA procedures in place, line, um, line management. If you're making sure that you have enough volunteers, that your celebrity guests have handlers, if you promised them one, making sure that there's somebody on site for facilities or bathrooms, making sure that all of those things are lined up um, near the frame of your show before you even start filling everything in is just another thing to keep your eye on that people may not have considered. So that's what I have for you guys today. I just wanted to talk about some tips and tricks that I've picked up over the years in the convention industry, just that have made my shows better, um, that have made them more successful, more organized. Hopefully we return to our, you know, back from the new normal or a new version of normal. But in the meantime, while we're all, you know, sitting here and trying to imagine a better future again, and you're gearing up to throw some sort of show, hopefully something I've given you today is useful. And I'm Lauren Stone with poplurker.com. Make sure to check out the site for evergreen content, opinion pieces, articles, listicles, snarticles. The whole site is editorials, our YouTube content, and our sister site, Toy Wizards, and the Toy Wizards YouTube channel. Lots of fun stuff there. All right, be good, guys, and thanks again for hanging out with me. Bye.